Okay, so now we've got the ammunition mm. loaded into the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank, can you show us how to load the gun? We sure can. First of all, because the breech is closed right now, the first round requires mechanically opening the breech or manually opening the breech, which is through this what we call BM lever down here. And for a guy like me who isn't all that strong, I'm fighting a great big spring over on the other side there. And there, the breech is now open. After the, the gun fires, it will go into recoil, which will automatically open the breech again and eject the spent round. So you never have to do the manual lever again until it's time to close the back gun, the gun back up when you're finished with it. So here's our round. And due to the length of the round, being fixed ammunition as it is, we have to put the, the nose in first and then swing the casing in like so. And if we were actually going to load this up the spout, we would take it and give it a darn good push to fling it in because inside here are the two ejectors. And we need the motion of the shell to trip them to cause the breech to close. Now I can't put a live round up the spout in this gun now, so I'll take this back out and switch over to my little short saluting rounds. That will go up in here like so and then with a rammer, and this is a bit of a fight, there you are, your breech is closed. And the next thing would be to fire. Now to fire, we've got two options with this one. We have full electric control, which is the big box up there to your right at the front. And down below here, the two push buttons. The right hand button is for the main gun. The left hand button is for the, your coaxial 30, so that you can trace her onto your target. And just in case there's an electrical problem, there's a foot pedal up forward of that that allows you to fire the main cannon. And I'll just go down and there it goes. That would be our, our roundups away. And now to get that out of there, we reopen. Normally, of course, the normally, of course, the recoil would have done that for us, and we'd have had this, or the casing from this one, of course, would come back, strike a pad that would normally be here, and then fall into a net. And then the gunner, or the loader rather, with his gloved hands would pick that up and send the casing out through the pistol port. Because there's not a lot of room around in here and he has to run around on this floor and you have these things rolling around under your feet, you're in big trouble. So all the casings are thrown out, except that one, of course, that I told you about before. You always keep one in case you have to go wee. And there you have it. Elevation and training. Down to your left is the red wheel with a knob on the side of it and that is for elevation and it can actually be linked up to a gyro unit that's down underneath here so that when the tank is moving the gun's elevation will remain on target. Not like today's tanks, it does not have the traverse uh, control system that will keep the gun on target even when the tank steers. However, you have your power traverse mechanism there, which is the large red joystick type handle that's down there between your legs. And by tipping it left or right, you will swing the gun left or right under power control. There's an extension that goes up to this handle up here, and that allows the, uh, the crew commander to actually operate the traverse mechanism himself. But the crew commander cannot fire it, and the crew commander cannot change the elevation. Right. So over here, I've noticed that I've also got a, a dial here. So obviously, it tells us the uh, azimuth of our traverse. Yes, it does. Um, yeah. Because in the event of a battle, we may not know exactly which way we're pointing in reference to the driver. Yes. Right. If the crew commander gives you a correction of so many degrees left or right, then you can actually see it quite accurately on that dial. Just in case there's power failure, of course, we do have our manual controls a large red handle sticking up there with a crank on it and a paddle that you have to squeeze will allow you to train the turret left or right under manual power. Before the turret can be moved, there is a lockout, which is just down, you can't, well, there it is down there. You have to turn the key a quarter turn clockwise, pull it out, and then let it go back up, 
upright again, and that will allow the turret to traverse. Right. So, so to be honest, I don't know about you, but for me, I'm a small Asian guy. I'm pretty comfortable in here, uh, but what about other people who are taller? What about you, Sean? Well, if I were any taller at all, I'm sure I'd be having problems. Yeah, especially with hatches down. Uh, and because in, when the hatch is closed, your head would be just touching it. Mind you, these things are normally covered with padding. But uh, right in front of your eyes would be the uh, periscope, the uh, crew in, commander's periscope. Indeed, this was a problem around the world. So for the North Americans and other people who are taller, it was too small for you guys. For us Asians, the turret size was perfect. It's just that there weren't many of us tall enough to drive the tank, as we will talk about later. Mm -hmm. Other stuff that we've got cluttering in the turret is a periscope for the gunner, a periscope for the loader, and the commander also has a periscope uh, similar to the a periscope on the hatch, similar to the one on the chaffee. Mm -hmm. Behind us, we've also got the radio, which the loader would control, uh, as well as an intercom system. Mm -hmm. Right, so with that out of, oh, also we would have, um, we've got mounts in here for uh, M3 grease guns, mm -hmm. uh, which tank crews would be armed with along with Colt 1911 pistols for self-defense. Yeah. In front of me, we've also got the gunner sight. Mm -hmm. So with that stuff out of the way, I guess we better climb up to the front and check out how we drive the tank. Sure. Okay, so now we're at the front of the tank. Frank, can you uh, show us yeah. all the driver bits? Yeah, here's the driver's hatch with his periscope cage. The hatches have got uh, sister springs on them because they're quite heavy and, uh, you know, it's armor. And to get down in, it's just a matter of stepping down, finding things to stand on that are relatively solid. And there we are. Okay, so now we're in the hull of the vehicle. We've climbed in. So, Frank, can you tell us a bit about how to drive the tank? Well, to drive it, First of all, you have to turn on this main battery switch over here. Uh, the upper one will turn on the power for starting the tank, and the lower one turns on the power for the radio. The instrument panel has your, uh, your two tachometers, one for each engine, two start buttons, and over here a speedometer. Now, the speedometer shows up to 60 miles an hour, but don't be afraid, it doesn't go that fast. It only does about 32. We have the... Uh, Battery charging ammeter, the two oil pressure gauges, one for each engine, a temperature gauge, which we can select left and right, to whichever engine we're monitoring, a fuel gauge, which can also be selected left or right, and the main lighting switch. And the light switch will not go into the main light position without pressing the lockout button so that you don't mistakenly turn your lights on when you're in a blackout condition. If I go to the other side, I have the blackout driving and, uh, and tail lights. Down on the floor here, we've got the clutch pedal, and at the moment, it will disengage the clutch for both engines. If there's a problem with an engine, I can come up here and pull this lever after I push the clutch down. When I release the clutch, only the right-hand engine will be engaged because I've locked out the left one. Back down again, push the control cable back in, and... Mm. Holy crow, why aren't you going back in now? There it goes. Gotcha. And then we're back on both engines again. To the right, I've got an accelerator pedal, which operates both engines at the same time. I've got the fuel shutoff lever, which has to be operated forward before you'll get any fuel at all to start the engines. This is a hand throttle lock. So we can bring the speed of the engines up and lock it at a certain RPM to operate the power traverse and stuff if the tank is not actually moving. <laughs> up in here there's two knobs and a lever and that is what are called the cold start knobs. It will actually start a fire within what's called the airbox of the engine and preheat the engines for winter starting. And the two main levers, these are for slowing down or stopping the tracks. So if I pull on this one alone and haul it back, it'll slow or stop the right-hand track and we'll do a right-hand turn. And same one for the left. And uh, just in case we need to. We have a horn. <laughs> Transmission. Transmission selector lever. You have to push down the clutch, of course. And in order to get either reverse or first gear, I have to push this button, bring it over to me, and then uh, reverse and first. 
once you go over into second gear, then uh, this button pops back up and you'll only get from two up to four. This is the transmission itself in here. The whole front piece across the front here, all this machinery, is what we call the control differential. And that's what these two levers operate. To, uh, if you slow down a track on this side, the one over here will tend to speed up. And this is how you steer your tank. If you pull both levers together and step on the clutch, you'll stop the tank. There is no brake pedal. Underneath this housing is the drive to the big generator that keeps our batteries charged. And below that is the big drive shaft that comes up from the back of the tank where the two engines are to drive the transmission. It's only one drive shaft. A common misconception about tanks with twin engines is that each engine drives one track. Well, no, the engines are joined together and they drive a single drive shaft through the transmission to drive both tracks and that's controlled by the tiller bar levers. Up top here we've got our ventilation system, an ex an exo or a supply fan here, and our blackout lighting. The uh, connectors for our intercom, the driver, the co-driver both have headsets on, and as does the loader, the commander, and the gunner. And uh, just below your feet, sitting in that seat there, is the escape hatch. And behind that seat is the stowage for more of the 76 millimeter rounds. The four bins we have here just in the center are for the periscopes. We don't tend to leave those in place, but uh, you pull the periscope out of here and you can pass it up through this little housing up in here and it will open the flap on top. Or when the hatches are down, you'll see the periscope fitting in the bottom of the hatch and it has a pivot. It'll actually rotate 360 degrees. Not that you want to look back at your own turret, but uh, it'll turn around like that. And just in front of you there on the right hand side is the uh, our little mock-up of a 30 cal. That's the bow gunner's weapon and uh, <clears throat> he can actually uh, go after, you know, you've got infantry trying to climb on your tank, that sort of thing. Uh, that can be an assist there. That's all on a ball mount so it pivots around quite a bit. I'm in the, uh, with this seat, I'm in the hatches down position but I can go up here and drive so I can see out the top or in the middle. Just depends on your height. Great, thanks a lot Frank. Oh, you're welcome. But just from sitting in here, this is exactly what we were talking about when, it, when we said it was hard for smaller people to drive the tank. For me, there's no way I'd be able to reach all the way forward to grab the yeah. tillers or even uh, I'd probably be able to make the gas pedals, but Aside from that, there's no way I'm getting the tillers. Yeah. Well, the tillers aren't that bad. You can lean forward. But what I have problems with is when you go from, say, uh, first gear back up into second, the throw of this lever is so long with me and my shorter arms, I have a problem with driving. We've got a guy that's six, six foot seven, and uh, we call him Shorty, and he can drive this thing fantastic because his arms are so long. He has no trouble at all. Okay, right. Thanks a lot, Frank. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I guess this is the end of the video, too, guys. So, All thanks right. for watching. See you guys next time. Yeah, cheerio.